we have the pleasure uh, as an end of, end of semester event to welcome from Paris, Anna uh, who already gave her a lecture uh, surrounding the issue of her, the, the topic of her dissertation. Uh, Anna herself is uh, educated in Russia and in France, which I think was the Portuguese stint, is that right? Yeah, Portuguese uh, in Russia and history in France. And history in France, yeah. And it is now completing the dissertation, right? Uh, it's not defended yet. But you're on your way. We're yes. almost there. Yeah. Um, and the topic of the dissertation is the cooperative movement in Russia, in the late imperial Russia and the early Soviet Union. Um, it's unusual in that it straddles the boundary of 1917, which not many of us do. And um, she's had the uh, she's had the, the generosity to offer to share with us an article which is in progress, um, in which she's going to take up some one strand of the um, uh, of the project, which is uh, the nature of property relations uh, in the, in the cooperative movement and the alternatives that the cooperative movement seem to offer both before the revolution and after. And so the format of this is that you should have read a paper. I hope you all were, you did have a chance to read the paper. Um, we have commentary from uh, Petya Padivova, who kindly came in from Princeton uh, after a marathon session. Well, it's been a marathon day for both of us. Uh, in the morning, we're, uh, we're, we're listening to Steve Kotkin speak about his third volume on Salah, uh, and we're commenting on that. And, uh, and now we're here with Anna to talk about the cooperative movement. And so Katya uh, will comment. You, got, uh, you have the option to comment if you want, but you don't have any obligation that uh, Igor could not be with us in, in person. So, Anna, would you like to start with some introductory comments? Great. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you for people from Paris who are there late. Uh, it is 10 p.m. in Paris. So uh, I particularly appreciate your <laughs> courage to stick to this uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, supposedly, you have read the paper. So I just uh, very generally um, resume in several words the idea. It is already a second draft, and um, my point is to have a, quite a, a resume, resumable paper that would, uh, at the same time, uh, question the binary opposition of state and the private property, and at the same time, uh, reflect on what are cooperatives. And uh, one of my problems is that if that is too much, maybe uh, it would be preferable to make two papers out of this because maybe it's too dense. So, like uh, one of the points of this draft is just to see what what is doable, what is not, and what are the strategies to choose. And uh, actually, the, the argument there are two arguments in the paper. The same, uh, the, the the first one is that uh, the word cooperative cannot be taken for granted to understand what it is, one could precisely look at the sector of economy it is acting in and the period and the geographical position. So uh, the word cooperative itself doesn't describe uh, what is going on. And uh, based on this complexity and uh, elusiveness of cooperative practices, it is a uh, like for me, uh, just something that I would like to understand and I would like to get this, uh, like communicate this uh, idea that uh, cooperatives are like a, something, a moving courser between private and state. And in order to place it in some place uh, in this gradient, one can not just say, oh, it's cooperative in between, but in order to place it, I propose to see both the legal text and the actual practices. And uh, the actual practices are the, the way the power relations inside the cooperatives are distributed. And I propose to do so in looking answer to two questions. Who owns what in the cooperative? 
and who decide how these goods are distributed. And I argue that uh, from like in the terrorist period, cooperatives were more often than than not uh, collegially, collectively uh, governed, thanks to the influence of the customary practices, and uh, despite of the uh, desire of legislators to extract the customary practices and just leave the formal law. And uh, this collective decision has allowed, actually has uh, facilitated collective decision on the way how the goods would be distributed. And so as I distinguished uh, this money, the, this profit can be used not only for individual use, but also for the, the collective that is uh, constituted from the members of the cooperative. And I argue in that in the Soviet period, this collective uh, that was created by uh, cooperative was enlarged to actually to almost the totality of its inhabitants of the city. And this had alienated the members of the cooperative from the decision making. So the cooperative were only serving the individual interest of the very narrow group. And uh, I would really appreciate your feedback on my paper. I, I am open to any advice that would concern arguments, would concern chronology, strategy, even style. And uh, just to be sure, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very sorry for the mistakes in the paper. And uh, please do not uh, stop on that mistakes. I, I hope that it was just a, a temporary point. So, I, thank you for reading my paper. So part of what you were saying earlier is that you're interested because you're not used to the format of, you know, what an American journal, for example, might be expecting. And you're interested to hear also comments on that about how to yes. structure a paper for the purposes of an American journal. Which I don't think that that's that different from other journals, but yeah, there's certain dimensions. So the, the audience might keep this in mind. Any advice on along those lines as well would be helpful. Okay, okay my turn. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yanni for inviting me <laughs> uh, and uh, Anna for sharing this interesting paper with us. Uh, let me stop with, I'm, I'm sorry for this personal anecdote, but yesterday I went to a store to buy hiking boots because I'm, I'm taking a group of undergraduates to Alaska. I mean, obviously I need special, like I cannot use my like, high heels. Boats, so I decided to buy hiking boats and I went to a place called Recreational Equipment Something. Uh, are you I? Yes, are you? Yeah, so and the, the, the person who is helping me at the boat said, you know, by the way, we are cold. I don't know, I said, so what does it mean? She said, I don't know, <laughs> but you pay for membership and then you get some benefits. So we have membership, but it's not like the other places where you get membership and you get discount, it's different. So I didn't understand what was going on when I went to you the cashier to pay for this uh, tremendously expensive hiking books. He finally explained to me that, oh no, you know, this is, we are a call. That means the company is owned by members like you. They are dollars and they employ you. And I thought, wow, this is a great idea. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it's certainly not the call, but uh, I just don't believe this, you know, that you pay $30 and you get membership or ownership of this huge uh, network. But this is an interesting twist of the, the, or using this popular and very socially appealing idea of, of uh, collective ownership to cover a very capitalist <laughs> enterprise, right? So that brings me to the question, so what is exactly the cooperative property? And uh, Anna starts with positioning this uh, cooperative property in between private and, and state. And um, I must say that I don't, I don't necessarily agree with this positioning because uh, we understand that why you choose so, because this is if, if we wish in property in this uh, landscape, there is an individual be on on the bottom and the, and the state will be on the top. 
But uh, let's think differently about that. So, uh, and uh, think about how properties govern, right? And the states, and the, the, what is common between the individual and state property is the existence of, of single will. We cannot, you know, when we speak about state, uh, state property, we, we do not assume that there is a actually collective of all citizens managing the property. There is still one single will, and this is uh, embodied in, in bureaucracy. And it, it's not a split, right? There is no idea, at least if we're not talking about public property, uh, about like shared interests. It's, it's a single will that speaks for the entirety of, of the sovereign uh, state of nation. So and in, in the, my vision of this, if we're not uh, led by the scale, right? So this is like a different dimension. One is scale, another is how it's governed. I would put on one side, individual private property in state and the forms of collective or communal property on the other side. So it's in, in a way it's anti thesis to uh, antidote to uh, to the state uh, property. And uh, you're right by saying that in, in the very beginning also that uh, uh, property can be created in different ways. It can originate from social practices right from from below. But historians are uh, lately, especially or not only historians, social scientists are saying that, well, in most cases, property is imposed from the book. So, this uh, mythology of, especially if something is collective or communal, it grows from, from below, it's like a desire to, uh, to unite like, the resources. Uh, in fact, it's not, it's, not, it's not happening. And, and in most cases, even the collective of all corporate property is the creation of some actors who come from outside and, and created through laws and, and legislation. And uh, this is common both for imperial case and the Soviet case. So what is common as well is that both uh, in the imperial and Soviet case, there is a group of uh, bureaucrats, experts who <laughs> studied, who have a certain idea of society in mind. Right. So by imposing uh, certain forms of property, you know, in this case, property, property they have some ideals. And in, in the case of uh, imperial Russia, it's probably kind of an alternative both to individual and communal property was seen as, as um, uh, ineffective. Um, in, in the Soviet case, and you, you, you pointed out that even in context of now, this was a not, uh, uh, this was not a departure from a communal, but more a departure from um, individual possession, right? So, and it's trying to uh, reconcile individual socialist uh, ideology um, and, and the mode of production and consumption uh, with the existence of the market, right, in, in one form uh, or another. So, um, maybe uh, I was one of my questions is what kind of like this ideal society you can elaborate perhaps in your paper had they in mind? by creating this very artificial construction of, of property, uh, uh, right? Um, and you, you also imply that the concept of uh, collective ownership is, is very imprecise, or, or I would even say not imprecise, but insta unstable, right? It, it always has the danger of pulling into, usually this what the, the individualized uh, 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 form of, of ownership. And uh, you refer to Eleanor Ostrom, uh, one of this, and a theoretician, a lawyer, social scientist. Was she? She's a lawyer. No, she's an economist, right? economist, right? She's an economist. So she got her, I think she, was, she got the Nobel Prize in, in economics from her, for her concept of, of common. Well, in fact, she was uh, in, uh, Ostrom. Um, wrote that she was, an, she was an optimist. She thought that uh, collective uh, property is not, uh, is not due. It's, it, it actually has a, a subject of, of, of uh, uh, which it can be either unorganized collective or organized collective. So it can actually divide, right? And it is in, in her work, she shows how to mechanism governance now, uh, collective cooperative uh, uh, property can uh, really survive in certain sectors of, of uh, economy. But uh, certainly, uh, theoreticians and uh, 
it's all in social plans, they kind of fall into two camps. There is a camp of, of optimists like uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who says that we just need to figure out how this uh, collective forms of all property will work. And there is a also a uh, camp of, of pessimists. Uh, for instance, uh, the most famous is um, uh, the, the article on the tragedy of commons, of, of the commons that show that, oh no, if, if there is only one form of property, this, this is uh, which can survive and this is individualized uh, form that because any collective form of property ended up uh, being like the this predatory and with the predatory practices of every individual. So I see that your uh, the article that you uh, shared with us is very theoretical and there are different ways to go with it. You can either put some meat on the bones and offer more examples and which I will encourage you to do, or you can really uh, become linked toward this theoretical uh, argument. If, but in this case, you probably want to get even more into this discussion of forms of property and, and the forms of governing uh, property. One of the, uh, and a political scientist who worked on collective action. For instance, the, uh, and this is, my knowledge is a very outdated, probably. This is the, mostly the works of 1960s, like Francis Mansour Olson, The Logic of Collective Action. So, the idea behind the, uh, the, all this attempt was to figure out when collective action co collectives. The, the, the idea of collective is when people have shared interests, right? Then, to what extent this can be sustained. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there was a lot of math and theoretical arguments in that, but he figured out, for instance, that all the large collectives under these conditions can pursue um, the goals together, but uh, usually the large collectives are endangered by the problem of free riders or the small free, free, free riders. The, the riders are people who are usually, when the cost of, of achieving a goal that are shared. Mm -hmm. People who are the main consumers of these goods are usually usually underpaid. They kind of don't contribute enough, but they get more of, of the, the collective, the input mm -hmm. of, of this, of output, right? So, uh, but the smaller collectives under certain conditions, they can actually do very well in achieving the collective goals and share goals without falling into the trap of everyone pursuing Individual interests. So I'm certainly I read it many years ago and don't remember the details, but you can easily like trace back to either this work, which was like again in the 1960s, or in general the, the, the whole literature and social sciences under this theory firm or special uh, economics. And uh, and as, as you can see from, from this literature, for instance, it all depends on the forms of governance. To, and on the how decisions are made and how the goals are collectively established and where and what moment of this collective discussion of goals the, the negotiation takes place and who participates in all of these uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to go like theoretical way rather than historical traditional, you may really want to uh, go and look at all of this uh, perhaps uh, useful perhaps not so useful literature on the commons mm -hmm. on, on the collective actions and the theory of firm uh, which is all about the shared costs and shared benefits and how these organizations remain stable and, 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 uh, and again this is the old whole, whole literature on the free riders and interestingly this uh, works appeared in in written by economists uh, for the consumption of like the theory of firms, right? The private enterprises, but they were later applied by people who work on, on, uh, on international organizations and, and geopolitical order in, in general. So it, the, the whole the system of like the theory went um, you know, viral. But speaking about this uh, historical material, and I would encourage you also to read um, the works uh, of anthropologists, for instance, Carol Humphrey, Carolyn Humphrey, her great book on the Karl Marx Collective. Uh, it's a study, it's a micro historical study of collective farm, 
of course. Right, so, and um, she also talks a lot about property and uh, takes the question up front. So we, we have this organization where uh, property is, there is no property in, 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 the, in the form that the capitalist world envisions, right? Property is kind of, uh, it's non-existent in, in the form of owning resources. But does it mean that the socialist property doesn't exist at all? Mm -hmm. She says no, because it's been transformed into another kind of alternative forms of, of ownership to political decision making. So this the book on Karl Marx Collective is a nitty gritty the analysis of this minor she was sitting like in in the in the offices of this uh Concorsa and all of this these guys and the party functionaries and, and observing them making decisions. And she came to the conclusion that there is this form of property. It's just, the, it seems the form of just distributing resources to this political decision making. So what you are uh, suggesting for the Soviet case is, is very, of, of socialist uh, corporates is, is very similar. When somebody assumes this uh, upper hand in, in making Political decision. So, in the way this uh, co cooperative Soviet enterprise fails is a okay, succumbs to this individualized um, form. But is it the form of property, or is the form of property is as Carl Humphrey described? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, if you um, do are activated so to this political decision uh, making. So, and I uh, have a bunch of other questions, but um, I, I would love to, maybe if you could give some um, examples of, of, of the in support of like, some evidence um, kind of stories, maybe in support of your um, arguments, uh, either the imperial or more like, uh, robust case of, of property, property in imperial and, and doomed case in, in the Soviet state. And also one more, like two more things probably. Uh, so this corporate created from the dough, right? And, and uh, this is a result of the work of experts, but there is always the state is present all the time. So what was the role of, of this uh, outside agents in uh, perhaps were they responsible for for what, is, uh, what, what has happened to uh, corporate? And also, you kind of alluded to the role of ideology um, that uh, kind of worked in uh, in supporting uh, this cooperative, and, and maybe this is also one most central theme in institutional economics. If you want to go that way, theoretical um, uh, ideology is a means to like remove frictions in, in the working of, of of organization. Maybe you can speak a little bit about it as well. So um, again, coming back to your original question, how to improve or revise your mm -hmm. article, I would say there are two ways. Again, one way is to give more evidence and example, mm -hmm. right? just to prove this and that, like the imperial, more optimistic scenarios of, of possibility of collective cooperative action in Soviet is less optimistic or doomed or not intended even. Another way to go full, full like for <laughs> uh, theoretical, but in this case, you really need to um, add something else and maybe uh, again, throw in some examples in support of, of, of your thesis. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, okay. Just a very short reaction because um, I, I really appreciate your advice. Thank you very much. I, I'm really glad. I'm glad to have choices <laughs> in, in different strategies. So uh, to give me some time to, to uh, explore and just uh, a, a very short um, comment. I, I'm, I'm so sorry that um, my paper had created the impression that cooperatives are between private and state property, and to be the, the use of public property that uh, is very ambiguous, because mm -hmm. I was intending this word as общественное rather than uh, just so you said both. You said both that it's public and private, and state um, 
Oh, you, you use both of them. Okay, okay. One paragraph. Yeah, it, it's my like it should be my um, not attention enough if there is a word like this. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, I would rather um, speak out of uh, the classic binary opposition between state like administration governance and market and a collective like общественное and private like th these two axes of the position okay thank you so much and uh, I we can take more yes questions. so uh, the, the floor is open you can raise your hand or you can write it to the uh, chat thank you for for sharing the your work um uh, i i quite enjoyed reading it as a to to see how a, a different type of institution or a different type of uh i feel that the, the discipline in the different country uh, organizes things uh, i am curious about what your paper will end up being is this like a paper for a journal or what are you hoping to do with this or because you have uh, you discuss all kinds of uh, cooperatives so i assume it's not a chapter from your dissertation and more of a synthesis uh for perhaps a journal or something like this so i was just curious about that because depending on where you see uh what, what you're uh, writing it for i think the the way that you present your arguments or as, as you asked at the beginning if you should make two papers out of this, I think a lot will depend on this. So I'm just curious about this. Oh, me too, I'm curious. <laughs> I, I, I'm still open to various futures. And uh, my point is really to present a, a synthetic uh, paper that would be accessible to different audiences. And uh, I could publish in Russian, but I don't feel like publishing in Russian today. So uh, I choose English as an international language. And uh, as a future, it, it, it's really, it, it will depend on uh, what would be best to, to get the point accessible. Because I feel like there are really two big uh, messages. One is just to explain what are the cooperatives, and the second is to explore the question. So maybe. Maybe, maybe what kind of journal we have in mind? Because uh, if it's like, on is it historical or social fantasy? Oh, rather a historical one. Mm -hmm. Because it's very much dependent on how you envision it. Zina, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, that, that I mean I see that you're kind of looking for where you think you could send it. Uh I think uh, I think it might be a good idea to maybe uh focus on a particular theme and then maybe include more examples for that and then that would be one paper and then you could you could if you want i think maybe you can have another paper out of this also with its own examples especially since you say you want to publish it in a historical journal so i think that could be a good way to like think through it that's just uh my take on this but i'm um looking forward to seeing what you decide me too <laughs> i'm really at the stage of uh, everything is possible <laughs> perhaps you can give some examples of like uh, like right now yeah right yeah. now like maybe some stories of, of uh, the yes. illustrative of, of the, the your thesis because yes. it's uh, we, we we see it's uh, like a result of your working mm -hmm. with material thinking about the material but material but can you give us yes. like illustrations so uh as for the terrorist spirit one of the best uh, illustration uh is the case of dairy cooperatives in the dairy producing regions mm -hmm. like siberia for example but also in Volga, where they were quite lucrative because they were selling to England, so they will they would have a better uh, selling uh, like, uh, contracts. And uh, this surplus that was quite important, and that was uh, like this direct uh, cooperative were created quite early. Uh, oh, sorry, late uh, in 1910, uh, a 
around and uh, thanks to the intervention of experts and thanks to the intervention of local Zemspo, it became a, a very uh, important administrative and commercial force in, the, uh, in several diary regions of Siberia. And uh, the board of directors of the diary cooperatives were actually local um, chief of uh, villages and the customary practices of collective decision-making were actually very uh, present in the way the, the, this surplus was used because uh, the, 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 the surplus was distributed among all the inhabitants of the village. And one part was distributed in function of the quantity of milk that every producer was uh, given, but also there was a part that was uh, to the collective interest so at the same time, uh, producers could develop their own farm, investing in uh, better uh, cows, investing in better uh, forage uh, grains. And in the same time, the village itself was uh, equipped with electricity, with uh, mill uh, that was petrol uh, motorized. And they were even thinking of buying a tractor in like before the First World War. So they were really uh, putting this extra money in a collective endeavor and uh, buying like they, they were also paying for school and uh, this kind of like really collectively decided decisions uh, that were possible thanks to the customary uh, pressure of how the village on the on the people who were juridically members, because the liberal expert would prefer that there was a maritime minority who are legally members and the others that are excluded. And the customary practice made actually uh, the, the collective uh, membership of the village society, they forced the liberal exclusive rule to be uh, extended to all the members of the village. So this is like the, the, the non-imagined uh, consequences of the liberal reform that actually came out not liberal at all. And this actually has allowed this uh, distribution of extra surplus. And uh, after the Civil War, these same villages that had already a very good experience of what are cooperatives and very good uh, governance skills, they tried to remake these cooperatives, but the, the, the equipment was uh, stolen and they tried to get it from the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, like just to get the equipment back was uh, a big deal because uh, as before, there was the same, like the cooperative board and the assembly governance, there was the same people who had a coinciding interest. And after that, there were a vast um, diversity of decision makers, Soviet locals, mm -hmm. uh, consumer cooperative, diary cooperative, a private diary uh, producer. And uh, there was no more possibility to, uh, to make coincide the, the, the interests of the collective in the one uh, like reconciling organization and uh, the co Conference that the state procurement organization were making to the cooperatives, where even uh, this conference was even worse for cooperatives than the private uh, conference. Mm -hmm. So uh, the structural uh, reasons they had impeded even people who wanted and who had skills to to reproduce the same experience after the the civil war. Yeah. I mean, the, the stories like this would really make your argument much stronger. You can like maybe use one the same mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. of the same like dairy farm, how it went through all the stages. That would be super. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Igor, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Thank you, Anna, for this exciting attempt to 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 merge, to marry, 
a legal economic analysis and history, right? And since Katya already enlightened us about collective action problem, about economics, and you know, partly about legal implications of the collective property, right? I just want to stress historical part of it. So, uh, Yanni, probably you will correct me, but cooperatives uh, were one of these few, very few institutions that actually survived through different political regimes more or less successfully. At least they kept their names, right? And ideologies somehow. So we have first cooperatives in, in the Russian empire, literally uh, immediately after the, 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 the abolishment of serfdom. Then they survived through the whole industrialization period up to the early 20th century. They survived Stalin reform, right? They survived the first revolution, February revolution in Russia, then the war communism, the new economic policy, the great turn, the death of Stalin. They survived Brezhnev and now we still have them in today's Russia. And it's not about just the temporality, right? It's, uh, it's also about different conditions, economic, political conditions that uh, uh, existed at different periods, right? So we have kind of liberal market economy in the Russian empire. We have state capitalism during the first world war. We have three or four versions of, of the Soviet economic regimes or policies, right? And probably the, my suggestion to you would be uh, to, to, to problematize these uh, changes because the, 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 the name cooperatives itself is deceptive in this context. Obviously, we deal with completely different institutions that existed in different institutional landscapes, right? And when you try to apply the, uh, uh, the criteria or analytical tools that you developed for the imperial time, for the imperial period to the 20s and, and the 30s, it just didn't work like that. So if, even if we limit ourselves with consumer cooperatives, in uh, the 20s, I guess to some extent, but definitely in the 30s and later, um, cooperative societies, Patrep Sayuzi, were just a, a, a state controlled channel of distributing resources, consumer goods for public, uh, first and foremost in the countryside, partly in, in smaller cities, right? And they still exist under this banner of. Потребительская кооперация in today's Russia. So it is not relevant, in my opinion, to try to analyze this form of, of state controlled uh, consumer trade, right? Uh, as a continuation or a development or an evolution or devolution of what we saw previously when membership in cooperatives was voluntary when they made their own de management decisions, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, but still I find very interesting your general conclusion that the Soviet period brought an, an interesting development to cooperatives when, as you put it, the individual interests prevailed over collective interests under the Soviet regime, which is utterly ironic, of course, right? Probably we should uh, speak here not of individual interests, meaning managers or officials appointed to, to direct a specific cooperative or cooperative union, right? Uh, it, it was not about management of cooperatives in, 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 in a contemporary meaning of the term because most legal systems today regard cooperatives, co-ops, as just a, a form of a corporation, right? Joint stock company, corporation. <laughs> and there is no actually a, a link to, to the discussions that originated from the 
uh, early 19th century discussions about collective property, like Katya put it, as a, as a separate form of ownership, right? You don't have that line of argument when you deal with a corporation, right? It's still a form of private property, not a separate form, <laughs> collective property, right? So uh, by the same token, Soviet cooperatives, since at least the great turn, probably should be regarded just uh, uh, as a form, an institution within uh, uh, administrative uh, command economy, right? That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, just um, thank you very much for your uh, opinion. Just yes, and uh, actually, I would not agree that um, that the Tsarist cooperative were uh, that rainbow uh, perfect uh, world where members were actually deciding themselves. Um, so for me, there is a continuity and there is an interest in saying that it is the same institution because what actually was much more visible in the Tsarist spirit was the discourse and the desire to make this possible. And uh, when we look at the real consumer, if we only talk on consumer cooperatives, uh, the practices vary very, very drastically uh, in concerning the, the type of uh, cooperative that is made uh, by administration for the workers of that uh, industrial site, for example, or it is just a local village, uh, they have replaced their um, merchants for a cooperative. So this, um, like for me, uh, there is a continuity. And even if we go at this website on the Census uh, of Russia Federation today, they still claim uh, in a, in a very, very conservative way, but they still claim uh, some points of the international uh, cooperative organization. And this, how to say, the, the international uh, cooperative consumer organization uh, has this very official discourse that was already very official and very uh, moderate. Uh, in, from the very beginning of this uh, organization in 1896, I guess. And I guess that the way we see it as I use, uh, today, uh, like something very dusty and linked to the administration, it used to be the same thing and, uh, in the beginning of the cooperative. Because when uh, I see who are the members of the uh, direct board of the equivalent of Central Series of the time, those, those are people that are very closely connected to the uh, imperial court. There are the, the high creams of the society, and the same thing for the British cooperative uh, central uh, wholesale, wholesale uh, institution. So I see there is a continuity. And uh, like, just this is only for the customer. Um, but what about agricultural cooperative? They have, like, uh, um, agricultural cooperatives in Russia, they had no ideological and economical head institution. They only had managed to have something kind of a wholesale center of coordination of all their businesses in the Moskovsky Narodny Bank only during the uh, First World War. But very, like, then they created a uh, very, very uh, short-lived institution during the Civil War that was dismantled. So credit cooperatives, as they were united by the, the financial uh, ministry and the central bank, they didn't have ideological center at the same character as Central Sayud that was always kind of a civic right, if, if we can say that, uh, like really out, of um, uh, institutional uh, making, like it was out of any ministry, but still it was very linked to, to the people from the same uh, circle. But they had no had uh, uh, ideological center. There was, I mean, you had the regional one, there was a very clear ideological center at the agricultural school. 
Um, I mean, they don't have uh, an institutional organization on the interior level, you know, say the East or anything like that. You do have what's right, in Wollaton, you do have the Siberian uh, butter manufacturers. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, the Congresses and at the school, you know, you have them. So there, there's something there if you want it, it's, you will find it. Yeah. It's not, it's not central. Uh, Francois Xavier, I think you're, you're the advisor of our, of our speaker today, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the co-advisor of Anna. So thank you. Thank you, Anna, for sharing your paper. Thank you all for organizing this, this discussion uh, on our, our work. And as everybody has said, I think we can understand how rich is our topic. And maybe the paper is too rich, as I, I agree with what most of what has been said. I mean, you can find you probably wanted to say too much in, in one paper. So you have very different um, aspects you can you could stress on. And probably if you want to, to, to write something for a, a journal or, or something like that, you have to choose one of the, to focus on one of the, the, the thematics you have in, in your paper. And so I, I just want to add some more complexity because uh, you, some people ask you about the norms and the, the legal frame of, of, of the cooperatives. And, and you, in your paper, you're also speaking a lot of practices. And the thing that interested me very much in your, um, in your paper is about conflicts and conflictuality. You're not, you're, you're not tackling this problem very directly in your paper, but it's, it's always there. I mean, because cooperatives, were just like invented as a way to solve conflicts. It's it's the, the clean way of uh, avoiding class struggle. You know, we're going to 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 build a cooperative. Everybody is going to speak with each other. We're going to have deliberations, vote, and it will be nice and clean. And it's it's not the bad capitalists. It's not the, the 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 bad socialist who wants to to make civil war and class struggle. It's it's a nice thing, and um, and 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 that's that's the interesting thing with cooperatives and and the way you. I, I would like to hear you more about this, especially when you're speaking about the, the practicing of deliberation. How how did your people in your cooperatives? How did they vote? How did, how did they, they make decisions uh, in the Tsarist time, but also in the Soviet time? As you, you have a very interesting moment in your paper when you, you're telling that the, the Soviets are very uneasy with, with cooperatives, because this is a way of, of, of I mean, voting and a kind of democracy and they, they want to avoid. And uh, they, they're switching the cooperative to the one-man management system, which is at the opposite of the idea, the very idea of cooperatives. So I think you have with this idea of, of co conflict, conflictuality, and the way to solve conflictuality, you have a very interesting point, which is not really in your paper, but might be a, a, a way to to it might be very interesting to hear you about this. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I feel that uh, not having put the, the example of really like a big frustration, I, I, I'm very sorry because uh, I would like to just everybody read my dissertation. <laughs> but uh, returning to, to the um, uh, about the conflict, just one of the first examples just pops in my head. Hand, uh, head, sorry, not hand. Uh, during the yeah, in 1918, I don't remember somewhere uh, in Perm region. Uh, I, I, I had the chance to have the the the, 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 the writings of the uh, board of directors. That were uh, reacting to the news that there would be Bod Radvovka coming. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, just deciding how do they present themselves as the cooperative members. And uh, what is quite surprising, 
like they, they convoke an extreme, uh, it's a like a normal local, uh, like a village uh, cooperative, it's not a center, like what also very important to distinguish is the regional level and local. So the so normal local village cooperative, they convoke an extraordinary uh, session. And uh, there is one who just came from the region, uh, and he said that there would be that uh, fixed price for bread, and they will be forced to give their bread, uh, so they will be uh, deficitary in their budget. And they vote in the majority of the I, uh, mostly. I, I don't know uh, for this kind of vote. I don't know, but mostly when they elect uh, members of the board, they vote uh, secretly. As for this kind of decision, maybe they just play a raise hand. And the majority of members vote in favor of uh, in, in favor for uh, participating in Podolska. And they say, we don't mind giving this grain uh, almost for free because it will be just only one year. Uh, it's just for the sake of the winning of the war. And uh, next year, the, the profits will cover the deficit. So uh, actually, the, this kind of decision making, even for something that usually is presented as a very contestatory uh, point, actually, uh, village uh, members they decide collectively to 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 give up their local interest to, to in sake of uh, major cause and. Uh, as for the Soviet period, in the very, very early 20s, maybe 22, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Uh, I have mm -hmm. an example of, a, like, there, there is a, also a village, a cooperative. Uh, and there is uh, the, the Soviet uh, local representative, who normally is not a member of cooperative. So everybody is very reward. The actually, locals they don't like the, the fact that a person that is outsider uh, participates in the taking of decision, mm -hmm. and he proposes that a part of the surpluses of the cooperative goes to uh, support all the Dieknecht or ah oh, no 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 it was German miners that were on strike, mm -hmm. and he said this money should go to them. And locals they said that they didn't appreciate that, mm -hmm. but they had to approve because they had no choice. And uh, what I know that uh, as for the service period, at least uh, the cooperative instructors that were supervisor of cooperatives, they were trying, I'm not sure if they succeeded, but they were trying to promote secret collections with tickets with um, around um, like there are different kind of uh, ways of secret voting. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, the, even the, the the whole session, like the way the, the, the assembly was taking place, it was distinctly different from the village assembly because they were sit sitting, they were taking uh, were uh, they were taking word one by one, raising hands in very disciplined manner. So it was really a school of representative democracy. And as for a Soviet period, uh, I cannot imagine that it was the same. But I have very little evidence. I just know that there was somebody who was arrested when he was going out of the assembly. And he was arrested because when the uh, assembly was forced to uh, pay, to vote for paying money to build a uh, Marx uh, monument in the city, he smiled. So after going out from the uh, assembly, he was arrested because he supposedly was not respectful enough to towards Marx. See, this uh, the procedures are very important, right? So when you discuss this collective collectivity, the like collective action, or uh, you know, procedures are important for for at least a democracy. And probably when you make an argument in the mm -hmm. article, you have still you, you still have space for like ten pages extra. You can add to submit an article to a journal. So I would suggest that doing using these examples of, for instance, illustrating decision making mm -hmm. process, 
in in the in the body of the uh, article just to support each of his statements. Right? So when you say mm -hmm. that it's uh, in Soviet time it was succumbing to individualize this predatory practices, but give an example. If you say that imperial cooperatives were are really really striving to share uh, uh collective costs but also collective benefits and then uh, this is all based on decision making this is your example so and this procedure is uh, they're hugely important and we know that uh, jane bourbon even here but uh from her book on on, on courts that she would uh, how how these procedural rules may Passing courts into something much bigger than the communal, like the, 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 the institution that, that usually we appreciate with the mm -hmm. passing courts. Mm -hmm. So they're instrumental. Everybody? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, thanks for your paper. I, I think there's a, based on the paper and also the discussion, I think there's a tension between your effort to use, I think, the Soviet cooperatives to make a broader point about cooperatives that is very theoretical. And the fact that there was such there was such vast changes in the property relations and the social context, you know, in the period that you're covering, especially in Russia and the Soviet Union, that I think, frankly, to make your point, um, you probably do need a book. And I'm wondering whether you can really mm -hmm. convincingly make your argument. Um, and I, I frankly tend to agree, but with Igor. I, you know, I'm not sure that um, you're necessarily correct, but either way, I'm, I'm not sure that an article is sufficient to make this case. Mm -hmm. I think the only way that you can make the argument convincingly would probably be to only have one case study. If there's one cooperative that you can trace from the Russian late imperial period, or where did you start exactly? Yeah, I mean, you started well around 1900, right? And then mm -hmm. if you go into the 1930s, perhaps, you know, if you have sufficient material, maybe you could do that. But I'm, I think that even that would be very difficult. Um, as, but for a historical journal, I think you would need, you know, you would need a lot of material to substantiate that. The other point that's here, um, and that's a more, I mean, in a sense, a more historical argument that you make toward the end, that especially in the net period, um, the cooperatives came to serve, I mean, you, you read that in pre-revolutionary Russia, they were they could better reconcile conflicting interests between the individual and the collective. Um, and then later in the Soviet period, which is counterintuitive, they became actually uh, the vehicle for serving the individual interests of a narrow group of its board of directors. Now that to me didn't become clear from what you write because there's no example. But mm -hmm. I think if you would take this point and focus on that particular period. I mean, I would find that's part partially because of my field of interest, but I would find that very interesting. I think you could speak both to um, how complex cooperatives could be and how meaningful they were, and you could speak, you could make a broader point about Soviet economy and Soviet society in that particular period. Um, I would just say that, um, I mean, I, I, I raised this before in a personal conversation, but this one person management. When it was instituted, I'm first of all not first. This wasn't just in cooperatives, and second, I'm therefore also not convinced by your argument that it was rooted in suspicion towards uh, the collective deliberation process. It may be the case, but you would have to prove it because I know it was instituted elsewhere, and I think it was largely for reasons of economic efficiency at that particular point. Um, so maybe you can speak to this and, and also give some example as to how this developed and you know where the collective connections between also the phenomenon of what was better known of the industrial directors and that man. But, you know, I, I think in that case, you would have a paper that's, um, I mean, that's much more limited in, in the chronology, but I, you know, it would be very interesting. I don't, I don't think anyone has, you know, really written much about the cooperatives in, in that period. And I think that, I, I would find that very interesting. It would be, sorry. In, in the NAP period, and from that standpoint, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, necessarily in, in cooperatives, but so I, I think you could, um, you know, it's, it's not a dissertation, it's not a book, what you're trying to do, right? So I think you, you need to think about um, what argument you want to, like what's the most important argument from your standpoint, but also the one that you can really convincingly make <laughs> within that framework. 
because um, it, it will be limited. And yeah, 10, 10 more pages, it's it's not that much if you if you do add examples actually. But yeah, that's May, may, may I add one point here? Because I just based on the discussion, I think probably should still consider including in, in, in your analysis what you call agricultural or production cooperatives and, you know, its superior forms, kolkhozes, collective farms, right? because uh, well everybody knows that the soviet system was obsessed with production right not trade and a pre pre soviet imperial populists who were the, was the main driving force behind the cooperatives of that time uh, to consider trade as as you know a segment of economy of uncomparable to production. So their ideas about transformation of peasant communes into something new, into cooperatives, probably uh, communist communes. These ideas were based completely on the on the on how they envisioned the productive uh, process. And the problem of collective action, they apply it first and foremost, not for distribution uh, or pooling the capital or distribution, the, the profits, but um, of dealing with this issue of balance between individual productive interests, households, right? And uh, collective interests of communities. And Katya's example with Carolyn Humphreys, Karl, Karl, Karl Marx Collective is extremely relevant in this context, I think. Yeah. I did, I did want to point out that uh, to add to, to reinforce what uh, Iga has been saying is that um, uh, so the, um, by the time collectivization came along, the great term, uh, the argument of some of the theoreticians was that this is a continuation of the cooperative movement. And it's simply the full realization of the constitution of the material. We try to look at an allegory of production in a way that the cooperatives did not. Um, so it's a big one. You know, sort of, you know, sort of, you know, if that's what they say, you have to take it seriously up to some point. Uh, but then who are we to say that they're wrong? Right? This is the genealogy that they bring. Uh, and as far as trade goes, again, going back to what you were saying, is that you know the, the general understanding among cooperative leaders before the uh, revolution was the purpose of the cooperative is to displace private trade altogether uh, because it's not productive, precisely what the uh, has been. What would be productive is actually producing something and that's yet, which is never good anywhere, closer to you get a dairy cooperative, right? Um, uh, or labor, something which, which rewards labor. You know, so if you're actually doing something with your hands and it's productive, you know, your hands, it's not productive, right? A certain kind of labor theory value. And so that's the issue uh, that I come across more when I do material rather than property per se. That doesn't mean that property is not an issue. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the expert to speak to about property relations is right here. Uh, we've actually thought about it recently. Um, and I think it would be useful, you know, as you go through your work, you know, consider carefully what the categories are at play, what they are saying, what they're not saying. So what happens with this article is it is, at the very least, two articles. I think it's doable. It can be done, but you know, so you ask how to will I write an article for this genre or for this kind of journal. I think the answer is that you decide in advance, you know, it's about this and not that, right? And then you end up with a very clear understanding in your head about what therefore needs to be spoken about and what does not need to be spoken about. Um, uh, so in this case, what you have is you want to speak about it as a property form, right? So uh, if it's going to be that, uh, then that's the primary focus. And for them, as I said, you know, turn to back then. She's your resource. Uh, she knows things. Um, and she's probably true. Um, so if you want to ask a question, and you can ask a question, I think you can bring all sorts of questions to the table. I think this would be an interesting and original one. Because I haven't seen work on that particular issue. You know, cooperatives as a well as a property form. Well, then the next thing to do is not to say, okay, so but I feel like I wrote and she said there is this opposition. You know, Ivanov wrote and he said there's no this opposition and all that, but to go to the actual sources and to become for that moment a literal basic 
the logistic auditorium. What did so and so say, right? What did that person say? And try to get some sense of, you know, what if, how were they understanding it as a property form per se, right? So let me just go back to our sources. I went back to the order. Okay, what did they say? What did they not say? Uh, did they use the term public? You know, I've shifted. Did they use the term uh, reach name? Did they use the term collective? Do they use the term collective? Right? And, and, now, what I found when I did this, when I entered my research at your stage, also, I entered into this terrain, and I said, my God, this is a total catastrophe. Nothing makes sense. It, it can be anything you want it to be. Uh, it can be theological. It can be apocalyptic. It can be uh, the liberation of labor. No, it's the liberation of trade. No, it's, it's just huge. Right? So in the end, what actually makes it a property form? And what made it a legal entity? Well, the law. Like it or not. Um, so we have to come to terms with the law set. So there's the statute that we mentioned, uh, that we mentioned of uh, 1895, um, which introduces the school of the government. That's one thing. But it's a very conservative understanding of, of the cooperative. You have to pay money into it, you have to repay your loans. Uh, so it's a, but then 1904 is another kind of cooperative, it's pretty big stuff, right? These are the two most, this is the most popular form in the end. And that one says, okay, you're going to have it, it's going to have memberships, and it can be the whole village, some of the village, it doesn't matter. Uh, but even though any cooperative form, exactly what Becky was saying, any cooperative form requires state sanction. Otherwise, it's not a cooperative form, right? Uh, it requires a charter, and these are provided by the state. So even though they may claim we're outside of the state structure, they exist only because of the state structure. The state legal structure. So this creates a paradox. When it comes to the idea, uh, those ones are the, the credit cooperatives, and these ones depend entirely on the state not only for the charter, but for the funding. They begin to get a hundred million rubles in, a, in funding from the state, which are taken from the, the savings bank. Right? Um, now, for that's a lot of money, right? It's, uh, and it's one of the main ways the government begins to pump money into agriculture. That's what they're meant for. But it still creates this paradox. You know, so are we really supposed to be, you know, some idea to me? Uh, are we supposed to be autonomous outside of the state structure when our charters come from the state, when our money comes from the state, uh, when enforcement comes from state representatives and government representatives and so on and so forth? That doesn't mean that it settles the question. It, it opens the paradox, right? So which, which are they then? Now, we're still not talking about property forms, but we are talking about um, not property forms, but uh, forms of organization, social organization, uh, which could be what they should be about. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, you, you decide, or you, you'll figure that out. Uh, so, part one would be, you know, good resources, whatever they say. We could say there's not a center, but there is and there isn't. You know, uh, the Petrovka is full of people who are nothing but your cooperative your right? Um, uh, and when the congresses meet, these are the leaders of the congresses. The statisticians, the agronomists, the, uh, the agrarian economists, and so on and so forth. You know the names, you know them very well. Um, but then the next part is, uh, uh, what does the statute say? Uh, which is a big show. So you'll get some certain kinds of earlier period populists who are gonna say, no, you know, leave us alone. We want to work without the state. Uh, we want to be independent and authentic and local and whatnot. And the new way that comes along, which is much more numerous, I think, is coming and say, no, we don't want the state to stay away. We want the state to be involved in it. Um, and there's even that argument that a cooperative is the smallest unit of state organization, right? as opposed to being the opposite of state organization. So again, you're going to get all over the place, which is why it's important for you to decide what interests you. Because if you only follow the sources, then it's the it's the, the road to perdition, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a uh, it's confusing because there's no coherence. Right? Anyway. And then comes the second part, which may or may not be related to the first. So again, this is for the purpose of writing an article. So you have your introduction. This is what I'm talking about, and therefore I don't have to talk about that. Right? And so you're liberating yourself from having to do certain things. Someone will say, "Ah, oh, but why don't you also do that?" To which you're going to answer. It will be in the dissertation, it will be in the book, or I don't care at all. I said I'm doing this because it should lead me to this record. That's, that's where you're the boss. You're the master, right? And your supervisor. But uh, aside from God and your supervisor, it's up to you. Right? Um, so the next part is about practice. 
which everyone seems to be coming back to, and rightly so. So if you have this forum, which as I repeat, is not quite a company forum, it is a social forum, or it's an entity, it's a legal entity. Uh, 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 you see what I'm saying, right? Um, uh, it's not quite speaking about this, it's not, for instance, it's not entirely a corporation, right? Uh, although it also has official sanction, right? Uh, it's a form of organization, a social organization, and certain kinds of cooling, but it's not entirely a property form. Um, if you see that, where it does become a property form would be a collective fund. Mm -hmm. That's different, and that's later. Um, so, having decided what form this is, I would say it's a social form, but you call it property, you know, you, you, you'll decide that. Then it introduced the question that Fetcher brought up, and your advisor repeated it, and others are repeating it as well. But if it's meant to operate this way, how attractive does it work? How attractive does it work? So, are they supposed to vote? Do they vote? What are the executive powers? Uh, are they supposed to go after delinquents who haven't repaid their loans? Um, the free riders? Is it the All these things like that. And so, in practice, how does it govern? So, there you move from a question of uh, a legal entity, the nature of that legal entity, social or property, and you move over to a question of governance. You know, how does a cooperative operate, and the many ways in which a cooperative operates. Now, I never related, obviously, um, uh, but you need to decide, as we all do, you know, my article is about this, and therefore not about that, right? And so when I come to you and I say, but what about, you know, this theoretician, I'm saying, I'm not doing that. I'm doing this because it has heuristic value. It helps us see something. It helps us negotiate through this morass of the use of the cooperative literature. But it's like it's almost as bad as the uh literature on alcoholism, right? It's everything thrown in, everything. Uh, so you have to it's important to do it in the submission. Right? You're gonna be this for me, right? See what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 Like uh, this is also I, I I'm very conscious of, of the the in fact, that with no examples and, and with a triple argument, I was uh, submitting myself to this kind of uh, for purpose. purpose. And, and I actually, I'm uh, taking this because uh, in this case, I can have the reaction to all three arguments. <laughs> and uh, actually, mm -hmm. I, I'm very, um, I'm very happy to have this conversation. And. Uh, so what I, I, would say I, what, I, I want to emphasize, you know, the purpose of the seminar like this is that we agree to be nice and you agree to accept criticism. Yes, so it works. Yes, yeah. just uh, one of my troubles was that uh, this, the, like, if you you remember in my paper, I used property, property, property slash enterprise. Mm -hmm. And this question of property, I, I, actually, I'm not sure if I would keep it in the final paper because it's really. Uh, like it's so far away and uh talking of property uh it's a, another conversation but still I, I wanted to keep it just to be sure that um i think this through and um i i totally agree uh with the, the point that, that talking about social uh legal entity is different from, yes and uh like i think that several days after I will digest all these uh, feedbacks, and I will come with a, like the central argument that I will be uh, able to to, to just to choose as a central one. And uh, I wanted just to to have a kind of a, a serial argument to 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 be sure that like I have tested uh, the arsenal. And uh, yeah. can I just add on on, on the, the second menu? Last point, who second, second <laughs> me? <laughs> so even uh, Ostrom's work, to which you refer in, in the paper, how it's called governing the common. The property is about governance, right? So it's it's all so mm -hmm. much centered on that. So you can uh, easily use property, but thinking about like well, what stands behind, and if if you consider it as a form of governing. It, or reconciling the video property interest. So it's it, it, all of this material that you told us about, about this you know, decision making, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes really central. Because it's uh, what it, what commons is the central problem of commons is governance. 
I said, how to make it happen? It's like, how it's done, right? So if, if, if you run it from this perspective, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then, and then you will kind of avoid all those, you know, traps of, of, mm -hmm. of legal stuff. abstraction and legal like debate. Yeah. So in that case, what you're doing is you're answering some of the same questions, but privileging that instead. And the other things will then become secondary. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one more thing that uh, you could mention when dealing and the yearning is also deal, dealing with sort of the vocabulary is incredibly difficult, especially or especially like I, I know more of the, the late sort of stuff, their housing purpose. It's like we created the illusion that getting an apartment. It's possible through some kind of participation in cooperative, not in like not through the distribution, centralized, but it was an illusion, right? So in fact, it was it was impossible to get into this uh, cooperative and get an apartment through like some kind of collective participation. It's just a fiction, right? So, um, as well as that, uh, I started with this uh, the, the the hiking boot store that uses the fiction of cooperative to induce you and, and pay for the membership, right? So, it's such a beautiful idea that everybody will exploit it to, to the end. So they, mm -hmm. And the Soviets were yes. doing the same thing. Right? And, and, and I have done this uh, vocabulary work with them. I have followed the way the, the official Bolshevik discourse was using the word cooperative and collective in Abshestuni in the way they were talking about uh, all kind of cooperatives. And I, I, I Okay, uh, I've shown in my talk there are several periods when they rather associated to all kind of cooperatives or only consumer cooperatives. And what happened very clearly in 28, the word cooperative becomes everywhere. And out of a sudden, in 29, in the winter 29, 30, it disappears. And uh, at the same time, the word cohos uh, goes up. And uh, as I, I would argue, uh, as for me, cooperatives and kampos are not the same thing. Uh, but the word kapirace, like for me, kapirace is an absolute notion that Bolsheviks use in order to have an umbrella notion of legitimizing the kampos uh, as something that is nice. Mm -hmm. But in the way the, the word kapirace is used, it is only used as to name to the se sector of the economy, not the uh, enterprise. <coughs> and uh, the uh, the legal form of artel, it's uh, like because kohos is their artel, and this, as the the Bolshevik legal uh, legal theoreticians say themselves, artel is something in between, like it's between in already. They say it is between the collective form and cooperative form. And Artel, uh, in the way uh, the Kolhos statute charter is um, chosen as a definite form preferred in 35, it's Abhidinyenye in Nastavarishistwa. And as all the previous form of cooperative work, Tavarishistwa, the fact they choose Abhidinyenye is very informative in the way they, they really cut in with the previous. Um, Vocabulary of uh, cooperatives. Thirty-five. Did yes. you say thirty-five? The charter of uh, uh, it's the, actually before that the word kalpos means no specific form. There are different legal yeah. uh, statutes, and in thirty-five they say it should be that uh, artel as a ta 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 abidine. Okay. Do we have anything you need to add? I think this has been useful, don't you think? Uh, oh, yes, yeah? yes, totally. I, I, I'm very happy to have uh, this conversation. And uh, what I will keep in, in, as an idea that maybe I, I really should make several articles with the different uh, arguments and uh, choosing different, uh, like, really like uh, preferring one one case yeah. and uh, making it clear and uh, it will be easier for the reader, <laughs> it will be easier for the writer 
and uh, I'm very happy to have this like clear in my head because um, actually this idea of a theoretic uh, article on something like political science or uh, juridical or economic it seems to be tempting but uh, I'm not that uh, in ease yet uh, so I wouldn't adventure in that field yet and uh, I know that there's a very rich uh, research in that field and in Amsterdam they have a whole very rich institution that's called Institute of Research and Collective Action they have a lot of money so uh, like there is something that happens and uh, like it's a vibrant field and maybe once uh, sometime it could be interesting to work in that direction but for the moment I would you can just do it as a case study. Use the, yeah. you know, still from them. They have vocabulary, they they ideas, and make it mm -hmm. a historical paper. And now the problem of many historical articles is that they don't, they don't use people. They don't use, and then there is argument that's very hard to find. Mm. So yours have the benefit of a clear outline. Uh, Argument or several arguments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is that you are on the other side of the spectrum, like mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe not empirical enough, and, and uh, uh, you can bring this all mm -hmm, together mm -hmm. several yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, thank for attending. So Good night <laughs> to those of you who are uh, in Paris. Uh, and um, uh, be well. Thank you.